If their rights are being taken away, then fundamentally you must defend that person. You must always be on the side of truth. You must always be on the side of honesty and integrity, time and time again. You should not be persuaded by your own personal motivation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Nahmaduhu wa Nusalli ala Rasulihi al Kareem, Amma Bad, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we are on verse number 25 from Surah Yusuf, the chapter of Joseph from the Quran. Alhamdulillah, all the recordings are available on your YouTube or Wastabaq al Baba wa qaddad qamisahu min duburin wa al faya sayyidaha lad al Bab. قالت ما جزاء من أراد بأهلك سوءا إلا أن يسجن أو عذاب أليم. That's how the verse begins. So Allah says that they raced, i.e., the wife of Aziz of Misr and Sayyidina Yusuf عليه الصلاة والسلام واستبقى سبقا means to run with one another. So they both ran towards the door. وقدت قميصه من دبر. And she tore his shirt from the back. Obviously, he ran to run away, to escape. She ran to close the door on him. So he was unable to escape. وَقَدَّتْ قَمِيصَهُ مِنْ دُبُرْ And she tore his shirt from the back. That's very, very important because that will become circumstantial evidence later on. وَأَلْفَيَا سَيَّدَهَا لَدَ الْبَابِ Only to find her husband at the door. So if you can imagine the scene, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't go into the details. He just says there was some running. We can fill in the gaps with our little bit of imagination, not too much of imagination, but a little bit of our imagination that something happened where she ran and he ran and she, somewhat, and she grabbed him from behind and she tore his shirt from the back. It's important Allah says from the back, only to find her husband at the door. وَأَلْفَيَا سَيَّدَهَا لَدَ الْبَابِ Look what she says. Qalat. She was the first one to speak according to the Quran here. Qalat. Ma jaza'u man arada bi ahlika su'an illa an yuhjana aw azabun alim. She cried. What is the punishment? What is the penalty for someone who tried to violate your wife except imprisonment or a painful punishment? So she spoke first yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam didn't say anything at that moment in time so we learn from this verse was baba that they both raised towards the door and we learn an important principle usul guiding us in our lives that when we are in a place of danger a place place of khatra then we should try and absolve ourselves from that place of danger we should not leave ourselves vulnerable in that place of danger and we should avoid sin as much as possible we should abandon sin as much as possible this is the first meaning for us that we learn from yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam he didn't stay there but rather he sought to escape and it's important here that we try our best to stay away from places or environments where sin takes place even if we don't engage in the sin ourselves, its impact, its effect will be laid upon us. We will be impacted by it. At the same time, there's a caveat because there are other people that we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them such strength of iman and taqwa that they can go to the place of sin and they can change that place of sin as well. Like our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would openly give da'wah to people in the marketplaces to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are amongst us, there may be amongst us ulama and pious people who may actually end, end up going to these places, not because they want to engage in sin, but actually to prevent sin. But the general rule is that when we find ourselves in these positions, we should try and remove ourselves. And if we see someone pious being there, then our view of that is they are there to do something good. They are there to something to impact to have a positive impact on that environment. We see from our elders, many of our elders, they would go to gatherings, not sinful gatherings, even gatherings where people would, they would debate with. They wouldn't debate with them because they agreed with their point of view. They would go to these munazaras to present the truth. So sometimes you have to go to these environments to present the truth of Islam because what happens if we don't go there, then there's no one to represent our religion or we had the wrong type of person representing our religion, the wrong type of spokesperson 
and then our religion gets misrepresented. So that's the important caveat. Then the second point here we learn is that when it comes to obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should to the point or to the extent that we are able to do so, we should try and do it 100% every single time. We shouldn't taper off. We shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't become tired or exhausted or wane after a certain amount of time. Even if no result is coming from it, even if you think that I'm doing this khidmat for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody's coming and nobody's sitting and nobody's listening, we carry on doing the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. Results ultimately in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Who would have known that some of the great movements today, Madhadid, Madaris, all these movements today that are doing fikr of deen everywhere, when they started off, their history tells us they were humble places, they were humble sites of fikr. Today, millions of people are following that movement today, those organizations, the masajid that we have in our towns, the Darul Ulooms and the Markas and everything else. That is because it all started off with sincerity. So we carry on doing the work. It may be that we don't see the fruits of our labor in our lifetimes, but if you have ikhlas in what you do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it a prosperous venture bi iznillahi ta'ala. So Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, what did he do when he was tested? He devoted himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's purpose was his ultimate game. He wanted to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when even the doors were locked and the ulama tell us that according to some narration, she actually tried to lock the door. He tried to escape as much as he could. He used his maximum strength to escape. And by miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was able to escape. So sometimes things might seem very, very difficult for us. Impossible even, unfortunately, because we are all absorbed by social media and news and all of these things. The propaganda is so powerful. Sometimes even Muslims, they buy into it. And they buy into the narrative that Muslims are in decline or Muslims are on the back foot. Na'udhu billahi min zali. What kind of iman do we have that when we see the dunya, the dunya we means becoming super powerful. We think that, oh, this is where real faith lies. Real faith lies in the heart. Real faith lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can have all the military, you can have all the hardware, you can have all the technology, but what you can't replace is what's in the heart. Eh? That's what really matters here. And we see this in the Quran time and time again, that brute force, brute, brute strength is not what will give you success. Even if you read modern history, military history, you'll see this in many, many places. Superpowers went there and they came back humbled. They left those places humble. I don't need to give their names. If you just read the last few decades, superpowers were humble. So it's not about military power. Yeah, it's about organization. It's about taqwa and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't defeat people who have belief in Allah. You can't defeat people who have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can bomb them. You can throw all the missiles on the world on them. But what they have in their heart, you cannot remove that. So this is important. We also learn a final principle before I move on, my friends, which is that we can only know what someone intends. Listen to this. We can only know what someone intends by their actions. This is called irada. Irada, a point of irada or included within irada is actions. So we cannot say to someone that you intended this until they act upon it. That intention is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe they did it for the wrong reasons. But we don't know about that. We can't go to someone and say, Oh, wait, you prayed namaz for showing off. You can't say that to someone. Because that is something that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They prayed the salah, finished. That's all we are accountable for. They did the ibadat, that is all they are accountable for, according to us. If they did it for the wrong reason, that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at people's actions, we have to judge by what they did. Not by what was in their heart or what was their irada. We leave that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that here that she not only had a ill intention with him, Yusuf alayhi salatu salam, but she acted upon that as well. So now we know. It wasn't before like she only desired him. Now she tried to lock him in a room. So now we have evidence that she had evil intentions. So the evidence tells us that something wrong was going on here. But we do not judge upon people's irada because we don't know what their real intention is what their real motive is and we should be very careful the amount of times i've heard people say Molana, he intended to do this 
مولانا اس کا ارادہ یہی تھا ہز ارادہ واز دس بائی دا سفین از ود اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی اور یو ٹیلنگ می دیٹ یو ہیو نالج اف دا ان سی اللہ ہیز گیون یو نالج اف دا ان سی نو وی نوٹ انٹرسٹڈ بائی مولانا ہی ہیڈ دس ہی ہز انٹینشن واز ٹو ڈو دس بائی وی ڈونٹ کیئر اباؤٹ دا انٹینشن دیٹ از ود اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی واٹ ایکچولی ہیپنڈ واٹ از دا ایویڈنس آن دا گراؤنڈ وی جس اکارڈنگ ٹو دیٹ اینڈ دین سم بڈی سے مولانا یا بے ہی ڈیڈ دس گڈ ایکشن بٹ ہی اونلی ڈیڈ اٹ بیکاز ہی ڈیڈنٹ وانٹ ٹو گیٹ بلیم دزنٹ میٹر وی ڈونٹ نو اباؤٹ دس وی لیو ات اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی دس از وائی از ویری ویری امپورٹنٹ یو نو وائی سی دس If you read the books of Aqeedah and Fiqh, the Fuqaha are very clear on this. Because the moment you open the door to allowing people to judge someone based on their intentions or motivations, irada, you open the door to fitna and fasad. You open the door to fitna and fasad. Because then everybody will start becoming godlike and saying that, oh, he intended this, he intended that. No, even the judge, you know, in Fiqh, when you go to the Qazi, the judge only judges by what he sees, what's apparent, what's in front of him. Zahir in front of him. He's not allowed to look into people's secret matters. He's not allowed to look into the hearts. We have a rule for this as well. We have a word for this called Diyanatan and Qadaan. Diyanatan in fiqh is where you leave the matter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So somebody might say, oh, I did not intend to divorce her when I said these three words, right? But a judge will say, well, you said it. So Qadaan, it's done. Diyanatan, it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a judge cannot look into your heart. The judge cannot see what's in your heart. He will say, well, according to the evidence in front of me, this is the ruling. Right? Somebody might say that, no, uh, I did not drink alcohol. Right? I did not intend to drink alcohol. The judge will say, well, we saw you drinking alcohol. Right? This is in a Muslim country, Muslim state. Right? If he says, I didn't intend to, that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It might happen by accident. So what I'm saying here is that we don't look into people's motivations. We don't comment about people's motivations. We say, by that matter is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very, very important. Usul here. The next verse. قَالَ هِيَ رَوَدَتْ Now look at this. Very, very interesting. She spoke first, didn't she? She spoke first and to try and absolve herself. Because sometimes guilt, guilt is such that you try to absolve yourself first. Yusuf alayhi salatu and waited, let her speak. And then he said, قَالَ هِيَ رَوَدَتْ عَنْ نَفْسِي Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam responded and he said, it was she who tried to seduce me. She tried to seduce me. And then there happened to be someone there, according to Quran, it's a witness. وَشَهِدَ الشَّاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُهُ قُدَّ مِنْ قُبُلٍ فَصَدَقَدْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ Someone said from her family or his, her own family, if the shirt is torn from the front, the shirt is torn from the front, then she has told the truth. In other words, Yusuf والسلام, was coming towards her and he is a liar. The next verse says, mm-hmm. But if the shirt is ripped from the back, then she tried to grab Yusuf والسلام, So the evidence is telling us that it was her who is from those who are lying. Right? And he is from those who spoke the truth. So from this, That when someone falsely accuses someone, it's important that you speak out in their defense. Hmm? Very, very important. There's no apathy in Islam. In Islam, what does apathy mean? You say, oh, leave it. doesn't matter. We're not going to let... It's not... Like somebody says to me, If someone's rights are being taken away, my friends, and you know that his rights are being taken away, what kind of coward stays quiet? What kind of coward stays quiet? You know that someone's rights has been taken away. Someone's rights are being violated. And you're like, no, we don't want to get involved. We don't want to get our hands dirty. Everybody wants to play it safe. No, Allah is saying to you here in the Quran, you're seeing this here, that no, it's not something to be silent about. You should come out and defend that person. It doesn't matter who it is. Even if it's a non-Muslim. Even if it's a non-Muslim. Even if it's someone you don't agree with. If their rights are being taken away, And fundamentally, you must defend that person. You must always be on the side of truth. You must always be on the side of honesty and integrity. Time and time again. You should not be persuaded by your own personal motivations. Hmm? Don't let Yusuf والسلام, here be declared a criminal. Yusuf والسلام, you could have said to be Molana, he's a prophet of Allah. Why did he, does he become humble and stay quiet? Sahih, na? Chup kar raho, stay quiet, go, take the punishment. But what does he say? He spoke out because he doesn't want to be labeled a criminal. His rights are being taken away. So 
it's not an act of piety to trust in Allah in this scenario. Just to say, well, I'm going to stay quiet. Let her say bad things about me. Let people say bad things about me. And I'm going to trust in Allah. No, you must absolve yourself, especially when the evidence is clear. So you see this in the Quran time and time again, because sometimes people say, oh, let's trust in Allah. And then the bichara, the person who's the victim, he feels like nah, nobody really cares about me. No, if you really want to be on the side of justice, fairness, then you must defend what is true. This is part of our religion. And also, another point here we learn in this very verse, that when you, we're not judges, but if you were a judge or you were asked to try and sort some matter out, you can only judge by what's apparent, circumstantial evidence. Right? You can't really see, in, in this case, you can't see into Zulaikha's heart, you can't see into Yusuf a.s. heart, but what you can do is look at the evidence. So Allah's teaching you here, look at the evidence. Whose shirt is ripped, which side is it ripped from, from the back or the front? If it's from the back, she obviously tried to hold him back, so she's guilty. If it's ripped from the front, then he was guilty. So can you see, we look at evidence, which shows to us also, my friend, because sometimes, you know, we, we sometimes show Islam and science as the opposite. You know, I hear this often, Molana, science and Islam are opposite. I'm like, no, here you're looking at the worldly evidence, what's before you. You're making judgments upon what you see with your eyes. You're not supposed to close your eyes in Islam and say, I trust in Allah. You open your eyes, you look at the world, you listen to what's out there, you do experiments, you test things. All of these positive things are part of Islam. Isn't our prayer, our namaz that we pray five times a day, what is it based on? What is it based on? Timetable? Don't say to me timetable. What's it based on? The sun. But how do we know the sun? How do we know it's time to pray? Of course, we don't do it anymore. We just look at the timetable and we look at apps. We base an observation. What do we base it on? Observation. When we have the calendar, what do we base it on? Islamic calendar. Observation. Hmm? Azan. Time for prayer. What's it based on? Hearing. Can you see? The Hajj. All of these ibadat, they all have in there part of it. Observation. You're doing it all the time. Can you see it? Subhanallah. In our ibadat, you're finding observation. Science is there, present in our ibadat. Can you see? Allah in the Quran, time and time and says to you, what does He say to you? Look around you. Look at Allah's makhluk. Look at the way He created the earth. Look how the sun moves and the moon moves. They don't go one, one iota ahead of what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to do. In other words, you're meant to observe the world and to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm saying this because sometimes people say, oh, this is all haram, this is not allowed. But how are you going to progress in the world if you're going to be like this? Your own ibadat, your own rituals. When you break your fast, when do you break your fast? When do you break your fast? No, when the muazzin does the azan, what's the cause for him to do the azan? The sun set. How do we know the sun has set? We observe, we observe the sun setting. Do you understand this? So the whole world functions on observation, which is the basis of science. Right? Observation. At the same time, at the same time, we understand that science doesn't give you complete answers, but it's a tool to understand the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change things. But Allah, through His wisdom, has created observation for us as a method to have some sort of predictability. You know why? Let me give you a very simple example. If we didn't know when the sun is going to set and rise, we couldn't predict it, it was volatile, what would happen? We couldn't function. We'd have problems. Not just during the day, throughout the year. When do we plant this crop? When do we cultivate this crop? All of these issues we will have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept a pattern. That's Allah's wisdom as well. So Allah has kept everything a pattern so that we can predict things. Right? These are, these are nizam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is part of Allah's nizam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's all powerful, He can also break the rule. Exceptions. Which is the miracles. The fire. The nature of the fire is what? To burn. And that's observable by science. You know that when you light a fire, it's going to burn. And it's going to burn you if you're not careful. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also shows you that He is the creator of the rules of physics, for example, in this case. So sometimes he can stop that rule from happening. He can inverse it. 
and that fire can become coolness for you as well. Hmm? So this is beautiful. I was with the surgeon just a few a week ago, and I was saying to him, you know, how long have you been operating on knees? Because he's going to go into my knee soon. So I was like, okay, how long have you been operating? He said, 20 years. He's an atheist. He's not a Muslim. He told me himself, we started talking for an hour. And he said to me, you know, um, I'd like to talk to you. First time I met him, he said, you seem very different. This is what he said to me. You seem, you seem very different. So we ended up talking about philosophy first because he's a reader. And then he said to me, you know, I said to him, you operate on knees. You have the same types of injuries, ACL injury, ligament injury, meniscus injury. I said, how is it that when I was talking to you, you couldn't guarantee me things? You've been operating this many years and you, if you do this, this happens. Like there's a pattern, right? If you, if you do this, this happens. I said, how is it that every time you, you, you've been operating 20 years and still you're, you're giving me like, oh, we're not sure if this will happen. We'll have to see if this will happen. I'm like, you've been operating for 20, 30 years. Surely there must be some sort of, you know, if you do this, this happens, this happens. He said, he said this is the amazing thing he said. He said, I used to believe in Darwinian evolution. He said, now I've become skeptical. I don't want to go into it, evolution. But he was talking about, he said, look, even I realized that there are things in the world that we just can't predict. He said, I don't know when I go into the knee what's going to happen. Because every time I go into the knee, it's the same thing, but the results can, be, can, can vary. It's beautiful. I mean, to me, it was fascinating that he was telling me this as a non-Muslim. He's reflecting upon his own job. He's like, it's not like a machine. He says, I go in, it's the same operation I've been doing for hundreds of times. But he says to me that, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. Ajib. And they say the knee is so well studied. We know so much about the knee. But yet we, the evidence is mixed on what, what happens. Can you see? This is what happens. SubhanAllah, there's this humility that people have. So this was interesting when I was talking to him because he, he was thinking about, well, there must be a greater purpose behind all of this. You know, that we can't even predict these things with regularity, even though I've been doing it for so many years. It's a nizam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, then move on. Let's move on, inshaAllah ta'ala. فَلَمَّا رَآ قَمِيسَهُ كُدَّ مِن دُبُرٍ قَالَ إِنَّهُ مِن كَيْدِكُنْ إِنَّ كَيْدَكُنَّ عَظِيمٌ This is verse number 28. So when her husband saw that Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam shirt was torn from the back, it was torn from the back, he said to her, this must be an example of evil cunning from you. So he realized the wife was evil and she was wrong here. Indeed, your cunning is shrewd. He said, Inna kaida kunna azim. It's very interesting here because the ulama starts saying, well, why did the husband not overreact? Because any other husband, if he had found out that his wife was misbehaving, he would overreact. There are many reasons the ulama give for this. Allah doesn't mention these things because like Imam Maturidi says, his ta'wilat al-Quran, it's not necessary information. Allah only tells you in the Quran what you need to do and what you need to do to get into Jannah. So there are speculations around why he didn't become angry, why he didn't shout at her. Like most men, if they found out, they would become very, very angry, understandably. Then he turns to Yusuf, alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, Yusuf, a'rid an hadha. Forget about this. Look at this. This is like, Yusuf, alayhi salatu has just been violated. His haq has been taken, but he's in a position where he has no power. Remember I said this last time. Sometimes you have to look at a person and look at the situation they are in. This is very, very important. This is what you call a faqih. A real alim, a real faqih knows that this person... He can't do something because he's in this really awkward position. So every individual person has their own circumstance. He's not in any position of authority, Yusuf A.S. He's a slave. What's he supposed to do? So sometimes you and you might come to me with the same question. I'm looking at your lifestyle. I'm looking at Muhammad's lifestyle. I'm saying, for you it's like this. For you it's like this. There's not a problem in that. Nobody can say Maulana Harun is being inconsistent. No, he's looking at, for you it works this way, for you it works this way, right? So here Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, he's in a very compromised position because he can't do anything. If he goes out, he's going to, you know, who's going to believe him? But he still tries to defend himself. Remember what I said, he tries to absorb himself. So his boss, if you like, says to him, you stay quiet. Forget about this. And then he turns to his wife. وَاسْتَغْفِرِ لِذَنْبِكِ إِنَّكِ كُنْتِ مِنَ الْخَاتِينَ Oh wife, seek forgiveness for your sin. It's indeed your fault. So he tells her to seek forgiveness. Now remember important usul as well. I don't have time to go into too much detail, but 
when you violate someone's rights, kisi ka haq, when you take away someone's rights, there are some principles that you should always bear in mind. First and foremost, you have to acknowledge that you've done something wrong. Most people, they're too proud to acknowledge that you've done something wrong. You have to have it within you that, you know what, I made a mistake here. That's itiraf. Realizing that I made a mistake here, number one. But that's not going to be enough here. Then you have to go to the person and right the wrong either seeking forgiveness or reparations or something because you've taken away their rights. Does that make sense? Mm. So first you recognize I made a mistake because most people don't even recognize they made a mistake. They're like, oh, Malana, I'm right. They're wrong. How dare them? <laughs> no, first you recognize I made a mistake. That's the first stage. Then you go to the person and you repair. Yeah? You repair the relationship. And then you seek forgiveness from them and then you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah, I made a mistake here. I went a little bit beyond what I'm supposed to do. And the final thing you do is what's called resolve. And I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to be really careful. And you patch up the relationship with that person as much as you can. Does that make sense? Just to summarize for you one more time. When someone's rights are taken away, hukuk ulibad is very, very important. I keep emphasizing it every time we have a dust. Very, very important. First, you realize I made a mistake. And you know what? I shouldn't have said that to him. I shouldn't have done that to him. You have to realize. But that's not going to be enough. Then you have to go to that person and say, Bhai, I'm really sorry, I made a mistake. Will you forgive me? And you'll see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings miracles. Your relationship will become stronger, inshallah ta'ala. That person, if he's sincere as well, it'll make your relationship stronger with him. And then you repair the relationship as much as you can. You resolve never to do that again. Never to make that same mistake again. So friends, always, 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 my teachers always tell me this. Never take someone's rights away. Never dishonor anyone. Never harm someone's dignity. Respect everyone. Even people that you disagree with. <coughs> don't publicly attack anyone. Don't humiliate anyone. That's not the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Don't tell anyone. And he said to her, seek forgiveness because it's your fault. That's what he said to Zulaika. So he said to Yusuf, ignore this matter. Don't speak about it before people because it's embarrassing for us. Don't embarrass us. Yusuf salam, he didn't embarrass them. This is also important, my friends. Even when someone makes a mistake, don't embarrass them. Don't like go out and tell anyone. Don't take away someone's dignity, even if they've done something wrong. Rasulullah says, Man satara musriman, satara Whoever conceals the aib, the fault of someone, Allah will conceal their faith, their aib on the day of Qiyamah. This is what Allah is teaching us in the Quran. SubhanAllah. Don't, don't, even if someone's embarrassed, someone has a fault, someone has a flaw, don't go around telling everyone, don't mention it to people. Unfortunately, we have this kamzori, we like to tell everyone. No, don't tell people. In fact, do the opposite. Say good things about people, bring people together, bring out a good characteristics. This is the way of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is important to remember as well. Never ever humiliate and take away the dignity of anyone. وَقَالْ نِسْوَةٌ How much time do we have, Muhammad? Is it 40 minutes? No, how much time have I spoken for? I'm going to stop. Sorry? 29. I'm going to stop now, inshallah. So we'll stop here, inshallah, ta'ala, because I don't want to take too long. Inshallah, next week, we'll move on to verse number 30 of Surah Yusuf. وَقَالْ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَأَةُ الْعَزِيزِ Right, it becomes very, very interesting because gossip, now the gossip spreads. So, even though Yusuf Ali hasn't told anyone, you know what happens? We love gossip. We all love gossip. We all love to get a popcorn box and we all like to sit on WhatsApp and we all like to know what's happening in this community, in that community, in this place, in that place. So, the Quran says this is what people do. It's not nothing, nothing to do with women. Men do it too. I've seen men do it too. We all like gossip. We all like to do panchad. We all like to know what other people are doing. So, the Quran says this is what you're doing too. Allah says, I know you. Allah saying, I know you guys. I created you, created every single one of you. You all love gossip. You all love to talk about other people. You all love to be distracted. Allah says, no, focus on me. Focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's nothing to do with you, you have no role in changing it. And why plague yourself with other people's concerns? Help people if you can. Do good if you can. Unite people. Like I've said time and time again, I will start Mufti Kamal Haq Bless him and um, put his, uh, his shadow over him. 
He always used to say to me, he still says to me that always, you know, even when I came to Lamak, he would say to Malana, Jor, 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 bring people together. You take the beats. Let them say what they want about you. You bring Jor. Right? Don't, don't be that person who divides the community. Bring people together, bring people together, bring people together. Look over their faults. They're not, he said, they're not ulama. They don't read the Quran. They don't understand the Quran. They don't know the Hadith. They don't know the Fiqh. They don't know all of these things. But you know it. Allah says in the Quran that the person who knows and the person who does not know, they are not the same. So we have to become role models for people. This is why we learn in the Quran, Rasulullah he was the embodiment of the Quran. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was asked, you know, what was Rasulullah like? She could have said many things about him. But he said, no, he was the Quran. He was like the Quran. Like you saw the Prophet sallallahu it's like you saw the Quran walking, talking. He was a living embodiment of the Quran. And the Quran is the kalam of Allah. Remember this. It's a speech of Allah. It's the most beautiful speech. There's nothing that even comes close to the speech of Allah. So when we're looking at the Quran here, it's an ibadah. Because we are literally trying to understand and uncover what Allah wants from us. And we're not just reading it for fun or for some sort of spiritual edification, but also to bring it into our lives. Some of the practical things that I've talked about is amalan, right? That we bring it into our life. We stay away from sin. We have good opinions of people. We do good in the community. We serve people. All these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran. Anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to stay from, away from. And we'll see this in the story of Yusuf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect.